Good morning, everyone. This is Larry Sampson. We're back for our Lunch with Larry series. Uh, excited about the discussion that we're going to have today. It's going to be around performance simulation, one of uh, the topics near and dear to my heart. So we're going to have a nice discussion about uh, some of the simulation activities that we might expect in the ventilator model. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a little bit about me, just to provide those links if you want to get a hold of us. My phone number, uh, email address. Uh, this is the scan code for our next series, which is going to be about digital health. So we're going to talk about how to do software planning uh, and software execution, software programming using some of our low code applications. So very excited about that series. That's going to start in a couple weeks. So we're starting to get people to transfer over if you're interested in how to do software development. Uh, I just added a link to this particular page. At the bottom here, we have the historical webinar location. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the simulation that we've done over previous webinars. And if you wanted to get to those webinars, this uh, web link is really uh, a great way for you to navigate to those webinars. And you can uh, take a look at what you'd like to see that we've done in the past. So uh, another webinar location for you, just to take note of that. Uh, today we're going to talk again about the ventilator model and so as we uh, build this out what we're doing is we're adding additional functionality more design activities and different sort of integrated activities across the product cycle and so today we're going to get into the front end of this we're really going to be talking about patients how patients interact with the disposable design uh, but as those use cases get worked out essentially what's going to happen over time is we're going to continue providing uh, functionality as it progresses throughout the product life cycle. Now, this last session, we talked a little bit about manufacturing processes and uh, how this activity we're doing now progresses to the manufacturing processes. So, uh, so this is really more the front end discussion. Uh, just to be clear about where we're working in the design today, uh, our 3D printed design that we worked on last week this is one of the parts that we're going to talk about in simulation. And so what we'd like to do over time here is do the simulation in such a way that provides us with some pressure drop and KPIs and, and performance of that nose part that we did the 3D modeling on so that we can do some production checks as we move into the production line. So what is the pressure drop and what are the flow rates to be expected so that we can have a discussion about that and how to test it on the production line as we move forward. Uh, just great examples of how it is that we can provide some functionality um, characteristics so that we can use those in the production line. The second thing is really this disposables design. And so on the left hand side here, we're, uh, we have a disposable that is uh, the flow between the ventilator and the patient. And so one of the things that we really want to do is characterize that if we were going to add another patient to the model. And so can we run more than one patient on this ventilator or not? These are some of the design considerations that we're going to talk about today. So just trying to put it in context so that you understand what we're driving at as we get into the actual simulation activities. So today we have uh, Dr. David Russ. He's our solution consultant for 3D, our 3D uh, Fluid Center of Excellence, an expert in our Star CCM uh, products. So David, maybe you could uh, provide us with a little background for yourself and uh, some, some, of the, some idea of your expertise. That would be really helpful at this point. Yeah, sure, Larry. Um, yeah, I'm a solution consultant, so my role is to work with customers to determine how our technology can best be applied to solve your engineering challenges. Um, I've been doing CFD for about 10 years or a little over 10 years now. And um, uh, in my time with Siemens, I've been spending a lot of time in the, uh, in the medical industry, both on the device side and on the pharmaceutical side. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Fantastic. So just to get started, maybe you could st start with a discussion about, um, you know, why is it that we use 3D simulation as opposed to the 1D simulation? We've talked a little bit in the past about uh, system simulation and, and we've had webinars on that particular topic specifically around this double lung model so maybe you could help us understand why do we need another tool right it, it, what, what's the benefit of 3d simulation yeah that's a great question Larry so uh, computational fluid dynamics or CFD using a tool like Simpson or star CCM plus that we see here on the screen here and 1d simulation using a tool like Simpson or AIMSIM share a common thread in that they're both forms of fluid dynamic simulations. Both can give us things like pressure drops and flow rates, 
However, any simulation or really any kind of model is only as good as the underlying assumptions that are used to build the model. A 1D simulation is exactly that. It's one dimensional, so it makes a lot of simplifying assumptions about geometry, spatial distributions, etc. With a 3D CFD model, we're not making those assumptions. Rather, we get to resolve the geometry and resolve the flow. So let's take a look at this part here. And this organic shape uh, was designed for additive manufacturing, and consequently, it's really one of a kind. Um, there's a, uh, if we look on the inside here, there's um, an orifice right here that's off center that's, a, that's near this elbow. Um, and we wanna know how is how are the, the internal flow features of this going to impact the airflow through the ventilator? So for a, um, a solid part like this, I can extract the fluid volume uh, to give me a shape like we see here. And the grid marks that you see on here, they correspond to the computational grid or the mesh that's been applied to the geometry. However, because we're resolving the flow in 3D, I'm gonna need mesh cells on the inside too. So let me go ahead and uh, hide the outside. And we can see on the inside, we have smaller cells near the walls where we have sharper gradients and then larger cells near the bulk where uh, the gradients are not nearly as intense. Um, so that way when I run my simulation, I can capture uh, what's going on in 3D both on the inside and on the outside. Um, so we'd asked about pressure drop. Um, the most basic question, hey, will this new part hinder the flow differently from the six parts it replaces? We can see here that uh, our simulation converged to a value of around just under 50 pascals. Um, and if this is really all we want from a simulation, just to verify the pressure drop, then we can send this number back into our PLM tool like Team Center um, and analyze this in a completely hands-off fashion. However, if we really want to leverage CFT simulation to uh, take our design further, we can actually step into our 3D data. So first, let's look at our pressure distribution. I can see the 50 pascals up here at my inlet. It looks pretty uniform. However, if I flip over to the outlet of my uh, fluid geometry, um, we can see there's some non-uniformity. Values on this surface range from about negative 10 to positive 10 pascals. Um, and the uh, distribution as we look at the flow through the elbow um, is much more varied. Let's go ahead and take a look at the inside here. Um, we can see that there's a large pressure drop as it goes into this orifice plate. Um, and uh, with these kinds of contours, this may be indicative of some potential oscillations in the flow. Oscillations in a flow for a ventilator could have some significant impact on patient comfort. Um, these oscillations could be verified by running a transient simulation. Next, we can look at the velocity distribution through our domain. Um, the orifice is causing our flow to accelerate and shift towards one side of the, of the part. And while doing so, it's creating a recirculation effect right here. Um, if this part is feeding into a filter, for instance, um, this downstream behavior is going to significantly impact the filter lifespan. All of the particulates that are going to be caught on a filter are going to be caught on this side of the filter, and down here, um, we're not going to, to, to be loading nearly as quickly. So it's going to create une uneven loading, which could potentially have an impact on the filter lifespan. So that's ultimately going to cause more uh, maintenance needs for this device. By resolving this in 3D, though, we're able to see these non-idealities uh, which can impact our flow. Lastly, let's look at the streamlines of velocity. I'm going to go ahead and turn on this animation here. And as we see these little balls go through our geometry, we can see that there's a little bit of swirl that's introduced near the, um, near the orifice plate. We can also see that uh, these streamlines slow down quite a bit down here in this corner. This is essentially a dead zone. Um, and dead zones can be spots that can harbor potential pathogens, which can allow contamination to spread. So by being able to see these details in three dimensions, we can spend a little bit more compute costs than we would uh, in a 1D model, but we can also get a deeper understanding of the flow behavior. So that's, that's fantastic. Any other uh, discussion about how to build the simulation that you'd like to uh, touch on? Yeah, so let me switch over to a different model. That last one is uh, pretty simple, actually, and let me start in, in X here. Um, so with any simulation, uh, the principle of you know garbage in, garbage out applies. So if you set up a model incorrectly, you're going to get incorrect results. However, within our Sim Center portfolio, we, preside, we pride ourselves on offering tools that are best in class for usability. 
So that way your organizations can leverage simulation data without the need of uh, a PhD expertise. So here in NX, um, any CFT simulation is gonna start with CAD, which can be created in uh, a, a CAD package like NX or a, a third party tool. Um, some CAD can be created directly in SAR CCM Plus as well, but um, you have a lot of flexibility, but it, it, at some point you need to start with CAD. And we are looking at uh, the model of uh, our ventilator that has been hooked up to two separate patients. Um, uh, and the the use case we're looking at here is, you know, what if there is a, uh, a hospital has a ventilator shortage, we want to stretch this equipment to as many patients as we can. So that's what we're trying to simulate here. So within NX, you can notice on my top ribbon bar, um, I have a tab for Simpson or Star CCM Plus. This plugin forms a bridge between uh, the CAD package, NX in this case, though we have connections with other CAD packages as well. Um, and it connects it to our simulation package, which is the Simpson or Star CCM Plus. Um, I can use this uh, to transfer geometry directly into a new Star CCM Plus simulation, along with any uh, parameter or expression data that might be built into my model uh like we see here these parameters uh, along with the geometry get sent over to star ccm plus automatically um, and it's going to be imported into a new simulation so in this window we're looking at a simulation that i built in star ccm plus using this geometry and i just want to highlight the key steps for creating it um, to familiarize with the interface here, in SAR CCM Plus, most of our outputs come to us on the right, but we can give inputs to it on the left, and our model setup is primarily going to be driven in this, uh, this panel right here. So if I look in my geometry parts folder, um, I can see that I have an assembly, which is the same one that I got from NX right here, um, and this uh, assembly... Um, it was built like many uh, mini CAD in a lot of industries, really with manufacturing in mind. And so, um, oftentimes, there, no matter what CAD your package coming, CAD package you're coming from, um, you may need to do some pre-processing steps here. So the first thing I'm going to do is create what we call a fill holes operation. Um, this fill holes operation allows me to specify which parts um, I want to use and then which surfaces on the parts that I want. So I've selected uh, these surfaces around my inlets and outlets, um, and it creates essentially caps on the open spaces of my, my geometry, because really what I'm looking for in the simulation is the wetted fluid space rather than the solid space. Um, and these, uh, these caps combined with the solid parts I already have allow me to use what's called a surface wrapper operation. Um, this surface wrapper operation is going to essentially uh, blow up a balloon on the inside of this geometry to, to give me a wetted volume that looks a lot like this. It's a way of extracting uh, a fluid volume from a, a complex assembly that allows us to cut out a lot of the manual cleanup steps that sometimes are necessary with CAD. It, pro it provides a, a surface that is, that is what we call closed and manifold. There's no holes in it and everything is stitched together correctly. Um, and that's going to uh, set it up in such a way that I can apply a mesh to it. Uh, remember, the mesh is the computational grid that we're going to use to uh, actually resolve the internals of the flow. So after I mesh it, we get a uh, the exterior surface looks like this, and it's filled with kind of soccer ball shaped cells on the inside. Automated hey, David, meshing. Maybe you could maybe you could comment at this point why it is that the patient's uh, lungs aren't part of this model. Why why are you simplifying the model just to give the audience an idea yeah so um, if you notice in this model we do have uh, a mouthpiece that, that comes around but um, the patients uh, have been cut out from this um, so modeling real uh, real world's three-dimensional uh, biological parts is, is a, can be a fairly complex process and when we talk about lungs in particular you've got a, a an expansion and contraction effect that is um, strongly uh, fluid structure interaction coupled and so if your uh, focus from a simulation perspective is to understand the dynamics in the lungs in particular then you could uh, potentially build a simulation that looks at this effect from uh, a um, a fluid side in SAR CCM Plus, um, and depending on the, the nature of the mechanics, um, uh, we might be able to couple this with a structural tool as well. But for the sake of this model, what I'm really looking for is the behavior of the disposable geometry. I'm trying to understand how this 
piece is going to behave because this is really what's changed. And so what that allows me to do is simplify my model to make something that's a lot simpler and gonna run, run faster by essentially just applying a resistance and compliance model uh, to my uh, mouthpiece so that we're able to account for the fact that as air goes in, there is an increased pressure inside the lungs that is going to going to have an impact on the uh, the pressure and the flow rates in the system, but without necessarily having to re resolve that. Sure. Um, but those sorts of those sorts of parameters can be uh, applied in star CCM plus fairly easily using what we call field functions. Um, in this case, I, I'm able to apply a, a field function for my compliance and for my resistance. These are not really fully scripted, fully programming language, but just really mathematical relationships that relates uh, my, my, my flow rates, my pressures, et cetera, um, and they can be applied to my boundaries here. But when I have a, when I have a, um, a model like this, um, I can uh, really simulate anything I want. Um, I need to tell my, my solver what physics I'm going to actually solve. So in this case, um, I have a number of models that are pre-selected, um, but the, the selection process is, is really just as easy as checking them off of a, uh, of a list here. So if I were to be creating new ones, I've got a three-dimensional model. I'm going to be simulating gas flow. Um, and I, uh, if I need to resolve the, the compressibility of the gas, I can choose a compressibility model or I can look at constant density. I can decide if I want to do steady state or unsteady state. Um, in this case, because it's a pulsatile flow, I really want that unsteady behavior. And in most cases, we're going to be looking at turbulent flow. Um, but as I click through here, it's really just a matter of checking things off of a list. And then what it's prompting me for next is contextualized based on what I've already picked. So if I choose a laminar flow model, for instance, my selection is going to be different than if I choose a, a, a turbulent flow model. That way you're able to focus in on the models that are important to you and not get bogged down by the, uh, the, the full scope of what SAR CCM Plus can do. Um, but for an experienced user, um, this sort of model can be set up in about an hour or less. Um, and for inexperienced users, um, between our training and our support platforms, um, we can get you up to speed uh, ASAP. That's fantastic. So maybe you could discuss a little bit how this can support some of these experimental uh, therapies that we're talking about. How, how is it that we would do the analysis and give us some examples, maybe? Right. So for this simulation, we're looking at this ventilator d that was designed to support one patient, but we've bifurcated it to support two simultaneously. So the first thing we want to verify are how are the pressures, the flow rates, et cetera, performing. So first, let's look at the flow rates. Here we're looking at the flow rates from all of the flow boundaries in the domain. Uh, positive values uh, indicate um, uh, positive values indicate matter leaving the domain, and negative values indicate matter coming into the domain. Um, and initially, uh, both of our patients are assumed to be identical. So they have identical lung parameters. Um, and so the blue and green line that represent the, uh, the lung one, or the patient one and patient two flows uh, perfectly overlap. We see though that there is an ascending ramp uh, type pattern which is coming from the ventilator. It rises for two seconds. Um, and then the, uh, the inlet flow drops to zero. Um, and at that point, um, uh, exhalation is uh, allowed by the opening of the, uh, uh, the, the valve on the ventilator so that the lungs can push the air back out. That corresponds to what we're seeing on this plot. Um, this plot is measuring the excess volume in the lungs. So zero corresponds to the point immediately prior to inspiration. And we see here that the lungs are taking in about 700 milliliters of air, which is in keeping within the range of what we could see with real patient data. But next, next, let's look at the pressure distribution. Um, we're looking at the contours of pressure at a given instant, of, instant in time. Um, not surprisingly, we see that there's a pretty significant pressure drop associated uh, with the uh, connector to the mouthpiece here. Um, and we can also see that during uh, the inspiration effect, the exhalation hose is pressurized. Um, this may explain the spike that occurs on the, uh, the flow rate chart right as the, uh, the valve opens up. Um, the, uh, but this is uh, really looking at what's occurring at a single incident time though. And as we saw, we have a six second uh, period on our ventilation. So let me show a quick animation of what that, um, what this pressure distribution looks like with time. And then I'm, I'm going to be pulling this up as, a, uh, as an AVI file simply because it's a, a fairly large amount of data that's been uh, simulated here. 
Um, but as I as I play through this a couple of times, we can see that we're able to track the pressure distribution as it uh, as it shifts through time and in space. So we're getting that that 3D space and time resolution. Um, but uh, based on what we've seen here, uh, for the case of two identical patients, when we bifurcate our geometry, um, the uh, the resulting behavior doesn't seem to have any negative consequences. We're getting the, the pressure distributions, the flow rates that we would expect. Um, however, uh, for real-world patients, um, and the real-world patients are not identical. So further testing may be necessary before we un fully understand uh, implications on safety. Sure. So maybe you could uh, just talk a little bit about how to do a safety assessment, you know, in this cross-contamination model that we're talking about. Right. So uh, remember we said from the outset that a model is only as good as its underlying assumptions. So the model that uh, we built here assumes identical patients with healthy values for lung resistance and compliance. So the pressures and the flow rates are completely symmetrical from one patient to the next. What happens if we relax this assumption? Let me switch over to uh, another simulation that I have open here. Um, and this is uh, this is a model that is assuming um, that one patient has the original healthy lung parameters. However, uh, patient two has a pre-existing pulmonary condition, in this case, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. COPD has been identified as a condition which puts a patient in the high risk category for COVID-19. So it would stand to reason that a higher proportion of those patients might need ventilator support. So this could be a, a somewhat realistic use case. So let's look at our flow rate data in this case. Um, we can see that patient one is getting a higher flow into the lungs. Um, from the outset, it would seem that we need to use some sort of diverter valve to regulate the flow to these two patients. Um, there, there's, there's a pretty significant gap from patient one to patient two. Likewise, um, we can see that patient one is getting uh, almost twice as much air into his lungs as patient two does. Um, we're looking at about 900 milliliters for patient one and just about 500 milliliters for patient two. So again, this could be potentially fixed with a properly tuned valve, though simulation could be used to help tune the valve position. However, these sorts of conclusions can uh, be drawn pretty easily from a clinical setting or potentially from a 1D model. A question that CFD is well positioned to uh, examine uniquely uh, is gonna be the issue of cross-contamination between patients. So here we're looking at streamlines for our velocity. And here at the beginning of our respiratory cycle, we can see that flow is coming out of our uh, out of our ventilator into our disposable pieces, um, and uh, it's splitting in the, the the two different hoses towards the uh, the two different patients. However, um, since our patients are responding differently um, to the uh, responding di differently to the um, the inlet pressures, we expect that as the, um, as the respiration cycle progresses, we should see that uh, perhaps we're going to see some non-symmetrical values. Um, here at the very beginning, we're starting to see that some of the flow coming over to this patient is actually bypassing the patient's lungs and slipping down the outlet valve uh, towards the other patient, um, even though this valve is closed. That's because there's a pressure differential between this patient and this patient caused by the difference in their lungs. Um, so, uh, to verify that this could potentially be an issue, um, I ran a passive scalar test. A passive scalar is um, it's a numerical tracer that's meant to represent the movement of virus through our domain. Here we can see that after going through several breathing cycles, um, it, a virus that originates over here uh, with one of our patients is able to propagate um, up this outlet stream over towards our, uh, our other patient and ultimately gets into our patient's breathing tube. Now, if you have two patients that are you know, at identical levels of recovery, and they're sharing the same virus back and forth, and maybe this isn't a big deal, but we have to recognize that um, different patients are going to have different viral loadings at different time, and there's also the potential that they just have different different other diseases, and we don't want to make uh, one patient sick with something that came from something else. And so the fact that this particular configuration shows the potential for cross-contamination, um, that means that we can conclude that there uh, is a significant risk here um, with the way this is set up right now. 
That's fantastic. So maybe uh, towards the end here, you could just comment on how these systems can work together. So uh, we've done this webinar in the past on AIM-SIM and how to uh, uh, simulate the, the lung function in the context of the ventilator system. So how, how do we integrate with AIM-SIM and maybe what would we do in the future if we wanted to do another session? You know, could we use HEADS analysis in, in the context of these models? Maybe you could help us understand a little bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, we recognize that uh, real engineering is done at a multidisciplinary level. Um, and so we've got 3D simulations, we've got 1D simulations, they both provide different kinds of value. And there's other tools as well that provide value as well. So being able to connect multidisciplines together to be able to give a more sophisticated and complete digital twin is ultimately going to drive greater engineering value. So. Perhaps the first thing that we could do to, to take this model to the next level is to actively couple it with the AIMSIM model. With the AIMSIM model, we were able to, to model the flow through the compressor and the, uh, the valving and piping systems within the ventilator. Uh, but we're replacing the portion of it that, that looks at the disposables on the lungs with this 3D model. And so essentially you get coupling points at this, these boundary conditions where data coming in uh, here comes from AIMSIM and then data coming out here goes back into AIMSIM. And in the meantime, we're able to get a more sophisticated understanding of what's occurring uh, inside this 3D space so that that can allow us to see how uh, a compressor that perhaps we've sized with AIMSIM will, or a, a valve tunings or controls algorithm with AIMSIM can interact with uh, concerns for cross-contamination with, um, with the, uh, the, the 3D model. Another thing we can do is add the heat technology into this. Um, at the very first thing we potentially identified is a diverter valve right here could uh, better regulate the uh, the pressures and flows to the, to the various patients. And we could use a HEADS model to help tune what the valve position needs to be for the given uh, for the given patient lung parameters. And so within that, we could help us to understand what the sensitivity of this particular design is, to understand how dissimilar patients can be uh, before we need to, to adjust our design. A third option could be um, coupling with uh, with our NX plugin that we have available. We can actually look at the design and the geometry of the components themselves. All uh, parameters or expressions that have been built in NX can be directly modified in SAR CCM Plus. And so we could use a model that uh, allows HEADS to change both NX and SAR CCM Plus parameters together to help us uh, build a better design that is going to give us a, a wider viable range. Well, that is fantastic. With that, I think we're going to probably uh, uh, finish up our session. Thank you, Dr. Russ. We're, I'm excited to have you back. We're going to uh, try to extend these models a little bit over time, and maybe we can get some HEADS analysis, just like what you're suggesting, into the model and provide uh, an example of what that, that valve would look like if we could um, improve the design in that way. So thanks for your time. It's uh, great to have you on the show. And just so everybody knows, we have our next session is Digital Health for All. This is, uh, again, about specifically about software development in platform systems for uh, how, how it is that we control the build and the uh, project management of doing medical device software. And also low code, how do we integrate low code into the um, development activities so that we can get tremendous production improvements. So thank you so much for your time today and uh, look forward to our next session. Take care.